So welcome everybody. This is Julian from Straight From a Scientist. I'm here with Gene. Uh, he studies sex differences in the brain, mainly associated with alcoholism and alcohol addiction. Is that right? You want to explain yeah, us a little bit more about um, what exactly you're studying these days and and what your interests are? Yeah, definitely. So my name is John Rivera. I am a second year graduate student in the neuroscience program here at Cornell. Um, and our lab is mainly interested in studying alcohol addiction and comorbid neuropsychiatric disorders like generalized anxiety disorder and depression, which are highly comorbid with alcohol addiction. And we're trying to map out specific neural networks and brain circuits that are driving these behaviors. So we're trying to get down to the specific neuronal projections in the brain, where they're projecting to, and what's modulating um, these signaling pathways. Now, that's really interesting. The first question that popped in my head when you were telling me that is, do you think that alcoholism is the core of these comorbid uh, psychiatric disorders or are the disorders in, I guess, what, what am I trying to say? Are they, is alcoholism a reaction of anxiety? You know, if you have high anxiety, are you more likely to drink more alcohol or is it the fact that you are drinking more alcohol that's going to cause you to have a higher levels of anxiety? You see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, no, definitely. I think that's a really good question. And uh, most of the data that we have now is basically after people become alcoholics, uh, then they discover these comorbid anxiety and depressive mm -hmm. disorders. It's really not enough data uh, showing, you know, if these factors led to the alcoholism. But I think it's multifactorial. I think there's a genetic component, an epigenetic component, um, an environmental component, definitely. And then... Um, there's also a baseline sex differences that are driving these. For instance, uh, females are two times more likely to have anxiety or depression mm -hmm. in comparison to males. So there's already a baseline difference just because of the way you were born. Yeah. Uh, not including all of the other factors, including your parents' genetics, the epigenetic modifications, as well as early life stressors, for instance, that trigger you know, these genes that could then turn on, as one would say, with epigenetics and then develop these drinking disorders. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we're definitely looking into. It's uh, very complicated and we're just trying to tease it apart little by little. Yeah, and of course, you know, in every case it's gonna be different. You might have the anxious person that begins to drink to try to, you know, calm down or, or take the edge off. Interesting, exactly. you know, I know alcohol, alcohol works on, on GABA receptors, correct? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, alcohol works on GABA receptors. It's a depressant, so it will activate these GABA uh, receptors, which have a um, negative uh, inhibition, a net inhibition, excuse net me. Net inhibition. So maybe if you're messing with the GABA receptors, you know, over a long period, um, maybe when you stop drinking alcohol, you're going to have a higher level of anxiety. Oh, definitely. That's when you will get the withdrawal states okay. um, and then the repeated cycles of drinking and withdrawal is what will lead to dependence. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how, how did you get into this field, though? Sex differences in the brain. This is a, quite a specific field and definitely an interesting <laughs> one. But what, what caused you to delve deeper? Um, so this is a topic that has interested me for a while, but I didn't really get into this field in until I did my post back. Mm -hmm. So by training, I originally got my bachelor's in chemistry. So all of my undergraduate research was in a whole bunch of random chemistry things. I did uh, explosives uh, research, I did microbiology research, and then towards the end of my bachelor's degree, I grew really fond of neuroscience and I went to a post back program at Tufts Medical School in Boston. And there I studied uh, metabolic and um, affective disorders using mouse models. And that's when I started seeing differences in females versus males in our genetic knockout models. And I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, why would this protein knockout affect women more than men or males more than females? Um, and then when I got into Cornell uh, during one of my rotations, I stumbled upon this lab that I'm currently in now. Um, and their questions really align with my interest. I personally have seen, for instance, addiction close up. I've known people who have suffered with addiction um, and I know how it can destroy families and the person's life entirely. Um, 
And then knowing that there are baseline differences between men and women driving addictive behaviors is something that I want to dive more into and try to help, you know, this population that's mainly, you know, what drives me most is how people see addiction, mm-hmm. how they think it's more of a choice, you know, the willpower, they don't have willpower to get over this, they choose to do these drugs. And it's really not that easy. There's more to it. And um, I kind of want to prove how women are more prone to this. And um, I want to try to map this out in order to have more effective treatments for yeah. women. That's interesting. So you're, what you're saying is that women are more prone to anxiety and depression disorders, which I completely agree. I know in, in Spain, actually, they have a huge problem with the amount of women that are taking anti-anxiety medication. Um, but from my understanding, it seems that more men are alcoholics in Spain, at least. This is, you know, I have no research or anything. This is just purely from what I've seen. More men are alcoholics or there's more alcoholic men, but there's more women taking medication, anti-anxiety medication or anti antidepressants. Yeah, definitely. So this is um, interesting that you mentioned that. So a lot of the statistics will show that men uh, show greater trends in alcohol drinking and alcoholism. Um, but if you compare it to like the past 10 years, there was an increase in binge drinking and alcohol use disorders in women by 60% and Whoa, 80%. Yeah. So the gender gap is like narrowing yeah, dramatically. Interesting. I didn't know that. And it's mainly because of how society views women drinking before. If you go back 20, 30 years, it was kind of frowned upon and women wouldn't go out as much and wouldn't drink as much, but now we see things differently and women, it's more acceptable for women to go out drinking and then they, you know, now will participate in binge drinking and they're more prone to binge drinking. So they try once they will want to continue this and they also consume more than men, which is kind of interesting. In all of our rodent and mammalian models, including monkeys, uh, females drink lots more than males. Whoa, you would think it would be the opposite because, you know, a male being larger has a capacity to, to drink more. You know, I don't know. Interesting. Consistent across uh, mice, rats, and rhesus monkeys. That's crazy, yeah. Now, you, you're in the, the United States now, and we are kind of famous for our college bin drinking <laughs> epidemic that we have. Uh, Definitely. What, what's your opinion on that? Have you seen it? Do you, you know, you're, you're in the field. What, what is your opinion on that? Um, I have mixed feelings about it because I partook in that characteristic behavior. (laughs) Of course. Like my time. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it's very dangerous and it could lead to long-term effects, especially for people who have a predisposition, as I mentioned before. Um, You know, just this cycling of binge drinking could activate, you know, a specific set of genes that could, you know, lead to more dependence along the road down the line, you know. Wait, so, sorry to cut you off. You're saying that drink binge drinking will activate epigenetic uh, modifiers that are going to cause you to want to drink more in the future? They could, yes. They could. It, it doesn't, if you're predisposed, then you're they, predisposed. Could definitely, they could definitely turn on or off a set of genes that could make you more prone to, um, to developing addictive behaviors. That's really interesting. Yeah, because you're stressing your body in a cyclic manner, and then this constant stress that you're applying to the system um is going to dysregulate it at a certain point really interesting um now does it depend you're you're studying specifically and mainly alcohol right alcoholism and alcohol addiction or is there other yeah yeah so we're focusing mainly on alcohol addiction uh, just because different drugs affect different brain regions of course yeah so we're just trying to focus mainly on alcohol addiction and trying to map those circuits out per se. Now, is there any difference between drinking beer, wine, hard liquors, or in our studies, it's all the same? No, because all we do is uh, we basically prepare a solution of ethanol in water. Mm-hmm. So we dilute it to 20%, and that's what we do our experiments with. Okay, um, interesting. An optimal concentration that mice don't find aversive. If you give it to them more concentrated, they won't drink it. Like drinking so they, a shot for us. <laughs> yeah, we're exactly. like, oh. I mean, it's 20%. That's more than, that's you know, a lot strong. of yeah. wine, beers, and That's like and a, yeah, a weak liquor almost, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty strong, 20%. Um, and these guys, the cool thing that we do with them is that we have a pretty novel model that's been applied in the past couple of years. It's called the drinking in the dark model. And basically, mice are more active at night. So mm-hmm. we're taking advantage of this 
you know, normal circadian behavior. And we give them ethanol in an intermittent access paradigm. So we give them ethanol for three days in two hour windows in their dark cycle. So they're more prone to drink. And then the fourth day we give it to them for four hours. We basically just measure the ethanol that they consumed. And we have a, a nice formula that gives us uh, based on their body weight, their ethanol concentration, based on the amount that they consumed. And they always reach a uh, high enough blood ethanol concentrations to be considered binge drinking. So it's like a natural way to induce binge drinking without forcing the mice. Because that's another yeah. previous model that you do like ethanol vapor, for instance, and you would just throw the ethanol on their face, but they weren't choosing to drink it. Exactly. You don't, we're not forced to drink as humans. We choose to binge drink. So it's a better model to represent what's actually going on in our brains. Now, do you, how did you create this mouse model? Did they have specific genetic profile or... Um, so I didn't create this model. My PI, Dr. Kristen Pyle, she used this a lot in her postdoc at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And the that's, last... where, that's where my buddy's at. Yeah, that's where my so, partner Connor's at. Cool. Yeah, he, uh, she worked in the lab of Thomas Cash, and uh, they used this model there. And um, basically, they found out that there is a genetic species. So the black six line of mice, are predom they predominantly drink more than other species of mice. So that's the line that we use for all of our experiments. Interesting, okay. Yeah, I just didn't know if you had any special strategic <laughs> genetic profile or anything that you guys used. Uh, we do use different genetic models to knock out different proteins because we're trying to map out how these proteins could affect you know, binge drinking. So exactly. we do have genetic models, but we do do this with wild type animals and get a similar trend. Interesting. Now, just a quick general question. What would you say are the main differences between the brain of, of a man and of a woman? That's a very complicated yeah, question. That's why I'm asking uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been, you know, a dilemma in science for many, many years. People have been trying to compare brains of, you know, females and males. And maybe in like the past decade or so in recent years, we've been diving more into what this really means. Um, but if you look at it as a developmental time course, we can we know that the brain is uh, mainly feminine by default, and that males actually develop when the SRY gene in the chromosome Y is expressed, and this initiates the development of testes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then during development, there's like a large production of testosterone, and there's also a large production of estrogen in males as well. And both of these hormones act on the brain, inducing like tons of changes and what they call masculinization of the brain. Exactly. Um, and then the region that's been studied the most is the preoptic area, which is part of the anterior hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. um, and within this brain region, there are multiple brain nuclei, and some of them, they have been shown to be different in males and females. For instance, there's a, a region that they termed the sexually dimorphic nucleus because it's a lot bigger in males than females and it drives sexual behavior in males. Mm -hmm. There's also different densities and projections in this brain region, um, which is near the BNST or the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. And that's one of the brain regions that we're interested in a lot in our lab. Um, and I can get a little bit into more detail with that because uh, for instance, my PI, Dr. Pyle, she, in her postdoc, um, mapped out this novel circuitry in the BNST that um, specifically in neurons that express corticotropin releasing factor, which is the stress neuropeptide, CRF. Um, she was basically able to show that the neurons that express CRF in the BNST uh, are responsible for binge drinking. And uh, we've been able to see some minor sex differences in the activation of these neurons as well. So we're trying to tease this apart further currently um, using retrograde tracing, electrophysiology, um, and tons of behavioral assays and pharmacology assays to try to map out the whole entire circuit, the neurons projecting in the BNST, where are they projecting, and what signaling pathways are driving these behaviors. That is awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I was going to ask the second part to that question about how hormones affect our brains, but you answered right there. You're saying the hormones are actually what drives the sexual differences in the brain. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, they're definitely like one of the main up. drivers. Yeah, yes, definitely. Uh, we, there could be others, but that's, I mean, the main difference between males and females is the hormonal differences. And that's what a lot of these sex differences are attributed to, but we don't know the exact mechanisms. And that's what we're really focusing on, trying to find out the mechanism of action. So then we can find other targets that we could then use for drug development, for treatment of these disorders. Exactly. That's really, really interesting.
No, I did not know. I was going to say, I was going to, you know, I would have guessed that men are more likely to binge drink, but what you're saying is, is quite surprising, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, because that's what we normally see. We're used to, like, men binge drinking because it was more socially acceptable, but now that, you know, times are changing, we're becoming yeah. modernized and, and accepting, then, you know, women are more comfortable, you know, partaking in these activities. Even though they're high-risk activities, they've become normalized in our society, so... Exactly. Now, another question about men and women stereotypes, at least in my in my opinion, I've always seen women in academics, they they seem to get better grades. They're way better at studying and memorizing materials. Would you would you agree with that or <laughs> um, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to be honest, most of the people that I've been seeing in, for instance, in the graduate programs here, most of the art classes are predominantly uh, women. Yeah, same with um, yeah, I find it amazing. I think it's great. You know, we're decreasing the gender gap in science, I and I know we need, to, yeah. we need to work on the diversity gap a little bit, but you know, we're working on it. Um, but there have been studies in rodents that I I'm aware of that have been shown um, increased memory formation in the hippocampus, in the dentate in gyrus, women, in women, women, uh, and in males when you have high estrogen and high yeah. testosterone. So the levels, the circadian rhythm of these hormones and the estrous cycle of uh, females do impact memory and learning. That has been shown in, um, in rodent studies. So that, I, that, that could you know, answer some of the questions, a uh, part of your question about- yeah, so, so maybe it's, it's less the, whether you're male or female and possibly more your hormone levels. Exactly. It, it could be a lot with just the hormone level, but for instance, men can produce estrogen as well. Yeah, of course. People really think about that, but in the brain, we have an enzyme called aromatase that turns testosterone into estrogen. Um, so we do have mechanisms to get rapid you know, production of estrogen in our brain, which is yeah. pretty cool and yeah. very unstudied. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a lot of people think, you know, men, testosterone, women, estrogen, but the truth is we both have both, you know, just with varying levels. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so that's really interesting. Now, are there any myths in your field that you want to to dispel for people? Um, I think there's a myth in society that I kind of alluded to earlier, which is, you know, addiction is not a choice. People see drug addiction as more of a willpower thing. Yeah. But I, I mean, this is kind of a drastic comparison, but, you know, people don't choose to have cancer. People don't choose to have these addictive disorders. You know, it's... It's a disease, and I want people to change their mindset and the stigma associated with drug addiction. I want people to see it as a, you know, a disease like many of the other neurodegenerative diseases that you know, we focus and study, and it's equally as important, and it affects millions of people in the U.S. and throughout the world. So I think we need to change the stigma associated with drug addiction. Interesting. Yeah, now this brings me to another question that's kind of um, profound, <laughs> but I was talking a couple of weeks ago, maybe like a month or two ago, with uh, a neuroscientist from Berkeley, and he's studying consciousness, and we talked a little bit about free Daniel will. Toker. What was that? Daniel Toker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked a little bit about free will, and I was going to ask you the same thing, um, since you just said that addiction is not really a choice. What other, do you believe in free will? Do you think that there's some things that we do in our everyday life that we don't really have choices over? You know, of course, eating, we have to eat, you know, we don't really have a choice about that. You're saying in this case, in some cases, addiction, you know, we don't have choices. So what's your, what's your opinion on free will? We can delve deep into the <laughs> theoretical. So, yeah, I definitely don't know much about, you know, the neuroscience of consciousness. Uh, I know Daniel is much, uh, has much better background in this, but um, I think free will is definitely a component of addiction because mm -hmm. initially the choice is yours, but then you don't really have a choice of like what happens to your brain after you initially try it, right? Exactly. So the first time, sure, it's a choice, but then you know the subsequent changes and adaptations in your brain, you don't really have a say in that and you can't really control that. So that's where I, I feel like it's not a choice down the road but you initially you lose your free will is what you're saying well but, definitely yeah. it becomes a priority your brain is dependent on a substance it will do whatever it can to obtain the substance to feel normal yeah. because repeated cycles of consuming a drug your brain 
will set a new allostatic point or a new homeostatic, homeostatic point, and it'll always want to be in that set point. So if it's if you don't have the drug, it wants to have the drug to be considered normal. Exactly. Now I guess um, this is the whole point of rehab, right? You you kind of you're waiting for your body to return to the homeostatic state that it was before addiction, right? Exactly. If we can get it back there, that's the that's the main issue, trying to get it back to where you were before the uh, addictive. Yeah, that's another question. Do you think these epigenetic changes begin to reverse from abstinence, or is it something that you know once chained, once triggered, we we you know? You're, I you're truly do not know. Um, yeah. I think it's because we don't really know what the epigenetic changes are either. Exactly. Yeah. Just the um, but you know, if we can pinpoint what these genes are and you know map this out then i think possibly we could try to target and reverse some of these mm -hmm. but for now it's mainly just controlling the the urges the cravings um and more of like a behavioral therapy versus a yeah. pharmacological therapy and that's where i think we're, we're lacking so that's why mapping out these circuits in order that's to important. develop more specific targets because for instance we can't target a hormone receptor because they're just so broadly expressed and important in our bodies you can't really you know attack estrogen receptors or testosterone yeah. receptors because it's just going to have so many adverse consequences and dangerous you know i've always warned people from messing with hormones because it's not like um they're long-term changes you know if you mess with hormones exogenously be it steroids or you know in my opinion even birth control is is kind of scary because you're changing the <laughs> i saw your face on that <laughs> <laughs> no, it just reminded me birth controls it just uh reminds me of in the 60s in puerto rico they used uh puerto rican women as guinea pigs without their consent Are you uh, serious? for birth control yeah yeah i made a post about it on my instagram i was i was actually pissed about i think i saw that <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i did see that that's crazy yeah I, when i was reading that i was like this is crazy well you know i when uh, birth control is basically trying to control the women's hormones via pill right and you're yeah. trying to maintain a level that doesn't you know that won't get you pregnant and keep the i don't know if it's increasing or decreasing the levels i'm not exactly sure Actually, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it because I haven't studied it, so it's better that we don't. But I just, it for me, it sounds dangerous. You know, studying the brain and all that, I think it's it's just a dangerous thing to play around. No, definitely. And um, speaking of women, I mean, a lot of these research projects have not included women. A lot of these preclinical trials so, yeah. not women. So I think the NIH in 2015 started mandating that females be included in their studies. That's probably um, a good idea if they're if your target is females. <laughs> exactly, and then sh we've already shown that there are already some baseline sex differences. So I think it's important that in any kind of study, you should include female subjects in order to determine if there are differences. You can't just assume that females act the same as male exactly. brains. Of course. Now this should Which, be for all drugs. You know, do you think they should have always a mixed group, or should they do two studies, one with males, one with females, or even three and one with a mixed? That's actually a good idea. Yeah, definitely. I think they should be studied separately, males and yeah. females. And then in order to better understand what happens in each of these environments, they're not the same at all. And then also checking the estrus cycle of the women to know, you know, when they're high estrogen or high progesterone exactly. or low estrogen, how is this impacting, you know, uh, and then you have inter-individual differences, you know, <laughs> science, is, science is, is quite complicated. Interesting. Yeah. Now, let's see, what other questions do I have for you? Um, where, what do you see yourself doing in the future? So you said two years, you've been, you have two more years left, is that correct? Yes, I'm in my second year, I'm preparing for my qualifying exam, which nice. should be around June. Then I'll be an official candidate, and then hopefully in three years graduate. And I'm not entirely sure what I want to do. Um, continue with the, the differences in between the sexes, or I think that's something I find very important, and especially in the context of addiction. So I think I might continue in this field, but I'm not exactly sure what I want to do. Um, I considered science policy because I think that's super important, and I mean, what you see the politicians commenting on nowadays, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, so I think it's good that they have advisors that actually know the science and can take that into consideration in order to benefit the public. 
exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs in in the science field nowadays that are almost more important or as important as actually doing the research. You know, the science policy, like you said, communication. Um, cool, really cool. Now, what what kind of things do you do outside of the lab? Um, I am really involved with a lot of different kinds of like outreach. That's something I've done my whole entire life. Uh, so I get involved, especially this month. It's Brain Awareness Month. We just had a, a whole bunch of Brain Awareness Week activities. We go to local high schools, middle schools, talk to kids, get them excited about the brain. Um, in Puerto Rico, I would go to public schools as well. And um, the, the public school system in Puerto Rico isn't that, you know, isn't that great. It, the kids there are exposed to a lot of violence and um, mm -hmm. drugs. So it's important to me to show them that, you know, they, they can do something else with their lives and they mm -hmm. can learn about the brain and aspire to more. Um, that's something that I, I've always been re really fond of. I also love photography. I love, when I lived in Puerto Rico, I mean, it's beautiful. I would always be at the beach, go hiking. So beautiful. Yeah. I love Amazing. Puerto Rico. I have to say it's a, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> You're lucky to have been born there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. It was uh, the best years of my life. I, I loved it there. Are you missing the, the warm weather and the beaches? or? Oh, yeah. We just got a snowstorm over here in New York City, so I <laughs> been missing the tropical climate, definitely. <laughs> yeah, New York is expensive and cold. <laughs> so, oh, tell me about it. Yeah. Crazy expensive. So how often but, do you go back to Puerto Rico? Just um, I usually try to go like every year or two. It depends. Whenever I can get away from school and the lab, things are pretty busy. So. Yeah, I can imagine. But it's important to think about your mental health and take a step back every once in a while. Go to the beach and hang out. Hey. <laughs> on, on that point, um, do you have any advice for people that are looking to get into to the neurosciences or even science in general? Uh, yeah, definitely. I had a very irregular, I guess I think it's a regular track to get where I was. I didn't have the best GPA. I had a lot of family circumstances that affected my performance in school. Um, don't let any of those adverse events um, decrease your motivation or your drive. Just go for it. Get as much research experience as you can. Research is critical into getting into any of these programs. If you want to go into a PhD program, you need lots of research experience. I cannot stress that enough. Grades are important, but research is even more important. Um, and then the exposure to research would also help you determine if a PhD is something you actually want to do. It's a big commitment. It's five to six years. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely uphill, but if you're passionate about it, I say go for it. Um, they're fully funded, which is great. So no student debt there. <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's really great. Well, it's basically a job. You know, you're you're doing a job, you're doing a project, and you're, yeah. In some cases, you you actually teach classes, right? Are you teaching any classes currently? <laughs> So yeah, they have that. We have the option here to teach classes. Thankfully, at Wall Cornell, they don't make you teach classes. Like you get your stipend. Yeah, choice, regardless. yeah. Um, but I did TA some classes just um, for extra money, and I I also like TAing. It's I love teaching. It's a great experience, um, you know. Public speaking, it, you know, you can practice. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great practice. experience. Yeah. And also, if uh, one last note with regards to getting into PhD programs. If you feel like you don't have enough experience and you don't want to go through a master's program, uh, post back programs are great. I mm -hmm. feel like I've gotten into any of the programs that I wanted to get into if it wasn't for my post back. I did two years of research. I developed proposals. I took graduate coursework. And this is also fully funded by the NIH. So awesome. just more information, Google NIH prep for post back programs. NIH. Yeah, I was going to ask you to explain a little bit more about post back programs. I don't really know anything about them, to be honest. So you said you did research, you took some classes, you wrote proposals. So I think this varies from institution to institution, but okay. uh, basically the main focus is it's like a stepping stone to get you directly into a PhD program. So the post back program will um, find you a lab that you're interested in, right? You join the lab. Like a normal graduate student, you develop a proposal, you choose a committee, your committee evaluates you, you pitch them the proposal, you meet with them every six months to talk about the progress of your project. Um, we took many courses about uh, biostatistics, science communication, poster presentations, grant writing, mm -hmm. um, which are very essential skills in grad school. 
Uh, we were also able to take graduate level coursework and they paid for the courses, which is great. Um, so I took some biology courses since I lacked in biology. Um, they also uh, pay for you to go to conferences and present your research, which is good exposure and good practice. Um, and they also uh, help you prep for the GRE in order for you to do well on it and get into these graduate programs. And then just for participating in these programs, a lot of schools give you fee waivers. So then when you apply, you don't spend a single dollar. So when yeah. I applied to I didn't it's like a hundred dollars now each up yeah each application is around a hundred dollars so, so yeah depends yeah. how many schools you apply to it adds up <laughs> that's awesome though um that's really cool I, I had no idea that those were so popular oh and it's it's great. and it seems like a per, you know it seems perfect you know they give you a little bit of experience in every field that you'll need which is awesome cool. yep. Okay, before we finish, I have a couple more questions for you about sex differences. <laughs> I guess it's not every day that you talk to an expert in the sex differences field. Um, so my buddy Connor, he's my partner, he sent me a paper about how male researchers stress out rodents more than female <laughs> researchers. Have you heard about this paper? Um, I have heard about the paper. I haven't read it, but this has been a theme that I've heard about for many years already. Um, and I, I'm assuming that this is true because, I mean, it's been published, so I trust scientific literature, especially yeah, when it's peer reviewed. Um, but I, I really don't know what would be causing this. I mean, uh, mice and rodents have huge olfactory bulbs, so I assume that they can probably sense different hormones or odor cues that will, you know, identify as male or female. Um, and I'm not sure what could be driving this stress response to it. Personally, I've handled mice for four years and oh, I haven't really noticed yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually it, some of my experiments sometimes work better uh, compared to female handlers. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't really know if this is a good or bad thing. It's definitely something to keep in mind when you're designing experiments, but you know, you shouldn't limit yourself just because you're a guy, like no, still go, just I, keep it in consideration. Yeah you're analyzing your results but um yeah i don't really know what could be driving this uh you know actually now that i think about it it makes a little bit of sense to me you know, if you see like if you were to see a, a male lion versus a lioness i think you'd be a little bit more stressed out when you see like a giant male lion. you know <laughs> i think it's just a natural response you know the males are normally more aggressive um and more the hunters of the the pack i don't know it makes a little bit of sense to me but but maybe you're right you know i think especially with handling animals the most important is just to be relaxed you know animals are way better at detecting um emotions than we are really you know they can sense if you're anxious they can sense if you're nervous about handling them i think that's, oh, yeah. that's the biggest thing you know if you're relaxed i don't think they'll be stressed out but that makes sense i think that we do stress out the rodents a little bit more than our female <laughs> counterparts, but I think if you're relaxed, I, I think you can cancel that out easily. If not, you know, a stressed woman versus a relaxed male will. I think the relaxed male will the animal way better. Yeah, I think that's something that needs to be looked into further. But um, yeah, I think yeah, it's a I don't study. You yeah. know, they yeah. But it's interesting. At least I, I thought I would just bring that up just to <laughs> see what your opinion was on that. That's super interesting, and I've heard it multiple times. I'm sure but, a bunch um, of people have asked you, yeah. Yeah, but like in at least in our lab, I am, I really take care of most of the behavior experiments, setting yeah. them up, and them, and training everybody in them. Um, and so far, we haven't really seen any any skewing of data because of this. Yeah, so. I would imagine. Now, are there any guidelines that require that you study both sexes for experiments or, or um, does that so work? So the NIH is, since the two, 2015, they're pushing towards that. So I'm not sure if it's mandatory, but you're probably, you have less of an opportunity of getting funding if you don't include females. I think everybody's moving towards including females in everything. Basically 50-50 um, or? <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, at least the most part, we, some, yeah. Yeah, we do 50-50. We like to, or sometimes even more females than males, because uh, we also like to track the estrus cycle. Mm -hmm. And we do this by uh, doing vaginal gavages. So we look at the cell morphology um, after we do the vaginal gavages. And then based on the morphology of the cell, we can tell what estrus stage they're in. 
Um, <clears throat> and we do this throughout multiple weeks in order to track it and see how it fluctuates and also to categorize their ester stage per behavior experiment. So for this, sometimes we need to have double the number of females than males because then we'll, we, we don't know what stage they're going to be in and we're going to try to get them in high estrogen and low estrogen. Yeah. So the more females we have, the more likely we'll have a, a nice divide. Interesting. Now getting into that, you know, this is kind of an interesting question. Um, having a girlfriend and living with her, I've seen her in her different ester stages, like you've said, <laughs> and there can be dramatic personality differences. Now, this is just based on the amount of hormones that she has in her body, right? And this is just affecting her in different ways? Or... Most likely, yes. Uh, I am more knowledgeable of fluctuating hormones in mice versus women. <laughs> <I really don't... laughs> yeah. But in mice, yeah, it does affect their behavior. What kind um, of effects do you see, just out of curiosity? Obviously, this is in mice, so women listeners, don't get angry at us if we say <laughs> Um, so it's interesting. So the thing is, a lot of previous research looked at behavior and estrus cycle over one experiment, and then they never really see any differences. But I did a behavior battery across a whole month, and I did tons of behaviors from anxiety behaviors, depressive behaviors. Um, and then once I categorized all their estrus cycle, I was able to see that when these female mice have high estrogen, they seem to have an anxiolytic or, you know, less anxiety. Less in, anxiety. Okay. Less anxiety. And these, um, which was surprising to us. We were expecting the opposite. But um, if you look at the light dark box, the elevated plus maze, the open fields, which are typical behavioral assays used um, for anxiety, uh, the females when they're in high estrogen, they seem to have this protective feature where they're less anxious. Mm -hmm. um, and this is seen across the same female that fluctuates from one behavior experiment to the other. So if she's high estrogen in one experiment and low estrogen in the next experiment, you see the same phenotype. So it's not just because the mouse is always anxious, you know. Exactly, exactly. Which is really, really exciting. Um, and in depression, we see a similar phenotype um, where the high estrogen females spend more time uh, swimming in the four swim test, so spend less time immobile, and yeah. the immobility yeah. time is representative of depressive like behavior exactly. or passive avoidance. Um, so, yeah, it seems to have this protective uh, phenotype just in baseline measurements. So, now we're trying to tease apart how this could affect binge drinking. Yeah, so maybe, well, this is interesting that you say that. I know in males at least, uh, high testosterone is connected to more risky yeah. behaviors. So it seems almost that low hormone levels are associated with, you know, what you're saying, depression and pro probably anxiety disorders. Yeah. So now we're going to try to take the part. Um, yeah. If they're low estrogen and we give them estrogen, are they going to behave differently? Like if we over -ectorize, over the females, will they, you know, behave more more anxious and more depressive like? And then if we give them ex to confirm ex it, yeah, exactly. Style, Will they behave less anxious? Will we Very interesting. It? Yeah. yeah. Well, these you, are the experiments that we're working on now. Just a quick question. I don't know much about the women's estrogen cycles, but during the period, is that a time of, of low estrogen or high estrogen? Um, or well, I think low estrogen. If I'm I think not, it's a low estrogen. So it's like a yeah. estrogen dump. They get, you know, they hit a rock bottom kind of thing. Yeah, they go down and then progesterone goes really high up. And okay. that's when they're most fertile. Okay. Interesting. Uh, just curiosity. That's really interesting. Yeah, I would think actually a high hormone levels um, would actually be more beneficial, at least in males and, and probably females. Well, depending on what hormones, obviously. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's see. What other questions did I have for you? Another random question. I asked my girlfriend if she had any questions for you. <laughs> and she said, what's the, there's a, a stereotype that women are more emotional and men are more logical. Would you agree with this? Are there any brain proven differences or is this kind of just a, a society um, stereotype? I think it's more of a society stereotype. Yeah, um, it's, would you would mention would that because for instance, uh, the brain region known as the amygdala, yep. which is normally yes. responsible for like fear response. Um, that's a lot more active than in males and females in development. Uh, which contributes to a rough and tumble play. So like a lot of male mice fight a, fight a lot. Yeah. They have like an active amygdala, which is like an emotional center. So if anything, men are more emotional. 
Interesting. Okay. Well, there you go. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> At least specifically to that brain nuclei. Yeah. But who knows, like in other brain regions, this is something I'm still learning about. Um, but I think that's more of a societal misconception, to be honest. Yeah, of course. I mean, I feel like there are a lot of societal misconceptions about the gender. There's also like feminized male brains that have, you know, higher estrogen or uh, higher well, exactly this is what we go you know there's always the difference between every individual there's going to be a male with higher estrogen there's going to be a male with you know lower levels of testosterone there's going to be a female with higher testosterone it's you're going to see it's a huge spectrum you know people like to you know categorize everything and put it all you know i'm i'm here in spain and they're like is the u what do they eat in the u.s is it cold there and i'm like the u.s is huge <laughs> you know there's yeah. uh, in florida <laughs> it's like you know 80 90 degrees and then you go to boston or you know washington okay. state and it's freezing so people love to generalize things and it's the same in science but Definitely. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> we have to move away from that. Yeah, we have to. Cool. Well, I think I'm running out of questions for you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'd love to chat with you again sometime if you're interested. Yeah, definitely. Great meeting you. And uh, yeah, nice to meet you. If people hope want this to, <clears throat> yeah, if people want to contact you or or read anything that you've written, um, where where can they go? Yeah, I uh, I post a lot on my Instagram, which my username is the Brain Scientist, no mm -hmm. space or underscore or anything. Um, similar to Daniel Toker's handle. Yeah, I was gonna it. say is the same, <laughs> almost the same. <laughs> yeah, there are two of us. Um, or they can always just shoot me an email at jkr two thousand four at med dot cornell dot edu. Perfect, and I I will post all this information in the show notes. Now, are you friends with Daniel Tucker? Because yeah, so I are. met him oh, at awesome. Neuroscience in Washington D.C. this past year. Cool. Um, my home we met through Instagram, and we met up at the conference and hung out. He's a great guy, very Super smart. Nice guy, yeah. Great research, yeah. It's great. I love interacting with other, you know, scientists that love sci science communication, um, like yourself. So I'm very happy I got to meet you guys as well. Cool. Well, hopefully next time I'm in New York, uh, I'll let you know. I should be there yeah, actually in a couple of months, so we'll see. Hit me up, definitely. Let me know. Awesome. Well, I'll put all your information in the show notes. Um, like I said, it's been a pleasure to speak with you, and thank you for sharing your interesting knowledge that I hope people <laughs> can. Uh, <laughs> get rid of their stereotypes about uh, males versus females and we can understand we're all similar yeah definitely awesome thanks for the time yeah appreciate it take care